Welcome back, everybody. How is your afternoon going so far? Am I going to have to do that again? Hang on. Okay, I'm going to do the thing again. <laughs> okay, uh, we just had a bit of a back and forth about how I should introduce our next guest. Uh, and we settled on, this is Amit, everybody. Take it away. Thank you. talk about um, researching and building an IoT network security solution. Uh, this was my research journey, which I will go into. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm an application security consultant slash software developer at Datacom in the cybersecurity team. Uh, I love computer science. I'm enthusiastic about all areas of the field, uh, especially programming, security, data communications, and data science, which this talk delves into a little bit of each of those fields. So firstly, why am I giving this talk? So back when COVID version one dropped in 2020, I was a postgraduate student at the University of Auckland looking for a thesis topic to do for my masters. And I was interested in quite a few things at the time, but mainly my main area of interest was the detection of cyber attacks. Uh, specifically the science of network intrusion detection systems, which identify um, attacks in the network by observing traffic patterns. I was extremely curious about how this was achieved. Uh, I had quite a lot of questions about the mechanisms and how this um, worked. Uh, what are the trade-offs in the system? Uh, and how can I like optimize or balance it according to the environment that I'm studying it in? Um, this is a really rich um, body of work in academia. So I wanted to apply it to a new field, and it was specifically the integration of IoT devices uh, for automating building operations in commercial settings, such as smart, smart buildings or industrial IoT, um, which... <laughs> yep. 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 Um, which results in traditionally isolated systems being publicly exposed, which is obviously a big security concern right, um, because they are publicly available from the internet, then it exposes it to a larger threat surface. So converged on all those things to, into my problem space of a lightweight intrusion detection systems for IoT-based smart buildings or large-scale IoT networks. And this is just the general overview of a smart environment or a smart building tech stack. You've got the IoT layer, the network layer, which it will use to send, the, the, the IoT devices will use to send information up to the cloud where a building automation system will then process all that information to intelligently manage the building's operations. Um, and yeah, it includes quite a few applications such as, you know, energy management or remote control and things like that. So as we've established, it, uh, integrating um, IoT devices uh, exposes the building to a larger threat service. This is because IoT devices are low cost and are built with a lack of security in mind. Um, so while individually these devices have limited computational power, a large aggregation of them represents a very effective tool for launching volumetric uh, amplification attacks against the, target, uh, against the target server for an attacker. Uh, this has led to the rise of IoT botnet malware, such as Mirai, Hajime, which specifically target IoT vulnerabilities where uh, default usernames and passwords are often uh, uh, not changed, so it makes it very easy to hack. So smart environments are a great network for um, attackers to exploit because they have a large aggregation of IoT nodes in their network. And we want to try, so I was keen to look into how to build a defense mechanism in such a network. I briefly want to touch over uh, a reflective amplifi amplification attack, um, uh, the, the mechanisms of the amplification attack. So an attacker will instruct the infected bots in the botnet to launch an attack. These bots will send um, DNS requests or NTP requests to the DNS server, which we're uh, pretending to be, uh, through IP spoofing, they will pretend to uh, 
they, they will spoof the source IP address of the target server. So when the DNS servers requ receive this request, they will then respond to the target server. And because DNS is a UDP-based service, uh, it's very easy to fill up the network pipe of the traffic of the target server. And the request size of the DNS request is much smaller than the response um, size. So this is amplifying the traffic that is um, sent to the target server, essentially. So how to detect if the IoT devices on my network are being exploited to launch a distributed denial of service attack? There are several detection techniques. Host-based and network-based. So host-based detection is when it, um, some system is running on the individual nodes in the network to monitor the log files to find patterns that represent um, viruses that are operating in the operating system level. Um, this is not a great um, technique for IoT because they're resource constrained, so you don't, it's, not, so it's, not, it's not ideal, you don't want to be running monitoring systems on them. Network-based monitor and analyze network traffic from a single sensor point, so this is ideal because then you, then you can um, monitor all the nodes from one point. Um, but the issue with this is it's, there's highly variable traffic in the network, especially in traditional computer networks, which makes it hard to identify attacks. There's different types of network intrusion detection systems, so signature-based and anomaly-based. Signature-based rely on a known database, on a database of known attack signatures, and inspect the packets to find those signatures in the, through st string pattern matching. Anomaly-based learn the normal behavior of traffic in the network to identify variations that represent attacks. Again, because of the high variability, attacks can be um, concealed within what is considered normal behavior. So these systems often have high false positive rates in operational use. They generally, anomaly-based systems have enjoyed success in academia, but they haven't, hasn't translated, translated over into, um, uh, into the real world. However, IoT devices have really predictable network traffic patterns. They communicate with a small set of endpoints, and because of their limited capabilities and resource constraints, they have limited flow types as well. So this is a promising area where we can use um, anomaly-based techniques, especially with the integration of machine learning algorithms and so forth. But that being said, an IoT network still has um, quite a diverse range of behavior because there's different types of devices as well. So that's something to keep in mind, which we'll tackle. Um, into the, which we'll tackle. So how did I investigate IoT traffic? Luckily, the researchers at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, have open sourced their IoT traffic data from their testbed. As you can see, there's a, w a wide variety of devices here, from cameras to controller hubs to energy manage management. And the data set includes benign traffic and a mix of benign and attack traffic, which we will um, validate our machine learning model on. We'll first extract data from the benign traffic to train our model and to establish a baseline behavior for it to learn what normal traffic patterns are. And then we'll test that on the mix of benign and attack traffic um, to validate how effective it is. So the type of attacks it contains, just briefly, there's one packet per second attack, a 10 packet per second attack, and 100 packets per second attack. So the nature of these attacks in terms of the traffic characteristics um, will vary as well. So it'll be a good test for your, for your machine learning model to t um, identify because one packet per second is quite a subtle attack. Uh, this is just a screenshot of, the we of their website where you can find the data, but I've linked it. Um, so this is the amount of benign data as well. So, so how do I use Python to process all this raw traffic data? So using a popular uh, PCAP analysis tool, Wireshark, this is what the, data, the raw traffic data will look like. So it's got the packets, as you can see, and it's binary, uh, and it's binary data. So what can we do with Python? So there's multiple libraries available for passing packet captures. Deep Packet, Scappy, PyShark, not all of them support 
both PCAP and PCAP NG formats, which is, can be important because a data set might contain both formats and you want to be able to handle that when in your passing script or function or however you um, develop it. Scappy, I found, is really slow, so don't use it for reading large amounts of traffic volumes. Uh, I found that it's probably better for packet crafting. Deep packet has pretty good performance and is, has a pretty re relatively friendly inter interface as well. Now, before you write your passing script or function, know what information you want to extract from the packets. Because the more headers that you read, the longer the passing process, because passing packets is a sequential process, um, generally, or you could, you could use multiprocessing, but that's another topic entirely. For the pur purposes of this talk, it's a, um, general, it's, a, it's a sequential process. Use, um, encapsulate, it's useful to encapsulate the extra extracted data into classes and serialize those objects, especially when you're analyzing a large data set, which I'll go into. Yeah, so as I said, you t you're taking the raw traffic data, uh, reading it through your passing function, serializing the objects, and then we can then feed it into our machine learning pipeline, uh, which will pre-process that data, extract features on that, and then train the machine learning model, and then validate and test it as well. For encapsulating the data that you extract, it's useful to have a decent um, domain model. For example, if I use the sensor point of my laptop to um, sniff my traffic when I'm watching YouTube or Netflix, the data that's in that will represent the interactions between a client and server, compared to the data that's in this data set, which is it has been used at the sensor point of the IoT gateway, so it has all the incoming and outgoing traffic at the network. So this represents the activity in the network over a period of time in this PCAP. So what that, what that means is this, and there is a network, and a network has many nodes, and a node has many flows. But a flow can only have two nodes, a source flow and a destination, sorry, a source node and a destination node, and a node only obviously has one network. So that's the relationships that's there, and then you can serialize that by serializing, by pickling the, the network traffic, I'm um, sorry, the network class object. This is, this is my passing function, just an example, which I'd like to go over. So you just open, it, open the pcat file that you reference to the file path with the context manager. Uh, you use deep packets pcat reader to load the packets into memory. So deep packet will load all the packets in the, in the, in the file as a list of tuples, where the, t the tuple is t here, as I've referenced here, t and packet, t, re oop, t references the epoch timestamp, and the packet is the raw binary data of that packet. And then we can use um, deep packets classes to unpack that binary data to easily extract the information that we need, uh, such as you know, ethernet source, um, destination, uh, and the size of the packets, and so on and so forth, which I'll get to a little bit. And then we want to correctly sort that packet that we have, the, the information that we've extracted into our domain model. So in this case, I'm storing the packet in the flow object. So then it will have the flow traffic. And then those, that fl um, through, through the network um, flow and node factory method, which is a creational factory method to either create a node and flow object and correctly sort the structure of um, the packet. Um, <clears throat> so the network class has a flow table to represent the, the network, uh, which has references to all the flow objects that are created, and then which will have the flow traffic. And it also has references to all the node objects that are created. And this is my network, sorry, then my node class, for example, some of the attributes. Um, and similarly, the flow, flow class, which the, the traffic attribute holds all the packet structures in the flow. So information you need uh, in the passing process, uh, definitely relative timestamp of each packet because network traffic is a time series data. So a relative timestamp of each packet is absolutely necessary to compute network traffic characteristics, which is needed to train your machine learning model on. Deep packet and datetime libraries make this really simple. You, the, you pass in, you use datetime to find the datetime of the epoch and then 
use have to get the first packet timestamp and use that to minus the current packet timestamp total seconds and the output is the same as what's displayed in Wireshark as you can see. Um, unique identifiers use the media access control address or MAC address as the unique ID for each node in the network. A node can have many IP addresses, but it can only have one MAC address. So that's your unique ID for your node objects. Uh, also a five tuple flow ID. So this is an ID for a TCP IP connection, a uh, unique ID. So it has is, is a tuple of five values, source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and the transport layer protocol, which is either TCP or UDP. And more recently now it's quick as well. So packet size, you need this to compute simple metrics, flow size, traffic rate. Uh, it's simple to measure with dpacket. You just call len on the packet that's been unpacked. Uh, if, you're if you're interested in analyzing protocols, like TCP flows specifically, then you'll need to call len on that specific packet itself. So make sure you're calling it at the right place is essentially what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> so what does it look like? So I'm just serializing the network object here. So you as you can see, this is all the, the node objects and then the flow objects as well, for example, the flow table. Um, so when I've pickled it, um, you can see that the extracted information is obviously smaller than the raw, raw file as well, and it's faster to unpack when I'm feeding it into my machine learning pipeline and stuff like that. So building the traffic classification system. So how are we gonna model the normal behavior of the IoT nodes in the network. <clears throat> this is achieved through a series of attributes or features to capture the normal traffic patterns. Uh, machine lo learning models learn on a combination of attributes or features, either packet level attributes or flow level attributes to characterize normal traffic patterns. <clears throat> Feature extraction is quite an expensive um, process. So if you're look so one of my research aims was obviously try to reduce some trade-offs. So how can I use low cost features and still achieve um, a decent level of accuracy in my machine learning model was one of my research aims. Um, so you, because IoT devices have limited flow types, you can use coarse graining of flows to um, categorize the flows in, in the device. So my idea was to use location and direction of traffic at the node. So whether the traffic was from the local network or whether it was from the internet and the direction, whether it's an input flow or an output flow. So this is the feature extraction process, essentially. So you've got the device flows. Um, then you will coarse grain the flows using the filter of location and direction, which will produce four flows that you will be extracting fe features on. Uh, the internet inputs, internet outputs, local inputs and local outputs. And then you use time bin um, techniques to, um, to extract features. So this is a really important part. So modern IoT um, traffic profiling research suggests that using a sampling rate and then a larger sliding window over the sampling rates on those flows to extract features over the sampling rate um, on just traffic rate features can uniquely um, profile the devices, like their traffic patterns. Um, I'll show you a couple of um, graphs which shows that, but it, essentially you are using, in this case I've shown an example of a 30 second sampling rate window and a 120 second sliding window. So the sliding window must always be greater than the sampling rate um, because you're extracting things like mean and standard deviation or total count, whatever features you want, but Mean and standard deviation are really important features here. Um, so the standard deviation of bytes over the sampling rate, over the four sampling rate windows, the mean bytes over the four sampling rate windows at that sliding window. So, on, so you will do this for the entire device's activity. Um, so how do I, one of the key bottlenecks here is effectively sorting the packets into the correct time bin in the sampling rate. Um, <clears throat> A, a neat feature is, first of all, get the total duration of the flow, um, create the sampling rate bins, uh, which is key value pairs of just lists, the number to the list, and then iterate over the sorted uh, flow packets. And to get the time interval to effectively sort it, 
there's just a neat little formula that I found, um, it, which is you get the current packet timestamp, relative current packet timestamp, minus about the first packet timestamp in the flow, uh, flow division on the sampling rate. Again, if you're experimenting in research, you want to experiment with different sampling rates to see how that affects detection accuracy and things. So there's a configurable sampling rate here, um, flow division on the sampling rate, and then times it by the sampling rate, which will give you the key in the dictionary to chuck the packet into. This is much faster than trying to iterate over the dictionary and finding it. <clears throat> so with that, you, as you can see, this is the gr resulting graph when you, uh, up, when you plot the standard deviation and the mean from the sliding windows, all the data points. See, as you can see, all the, they cluster really well. So different IoT devices have their own little cluster here, and even devices of the same type, such as cameras, um, have clustered in different um, places because they have their own traffic patterns. So a key thing with IoT devices is they might, different vendors might use different protocol stacks. For example, in a camera, you might have one that's using TCP and one that's using UDP. The resulting traffic patterns in that will be different because of their protocol stack. So that's important to capture. So to tackle that in your machine learning classification models, um, what's often done is to dedicate a lightweight classification model for each node in the network. That way, it learns the traffic patterns for that particular node itself. And because you're dedicating a model for each node uh, and for it to be a scalable solution, you want it to be using a very lightweight um, machine learning algorithm to do this. You don't want to be using a neural network and dedicating a neural network for each node in your network. That's not ideal. So as I mentioned earlier, the coast, uh, this was done on all um, traffic at the source node, both sent and received. If we further filter that down based on the four flows that we identified earlier, local inputs, uh, internet inputs, and so on and so forth, you can see that two devices have ex completely different traffic patterns. And this, this is their normal traffic patterns here. Uh, you can see that that's, they have different fingerprints. <clears throat> and that's essentially the data that we'll be feeding in, or I'll be feeding in for, for my mach machine learning model. And this is done uh, by extracting uh, the features in the sliding window as shown earlier. And this is, these are the data points that we're feeding in to this uh, classification model. So firstly, as I mentioned, you want a lightweight algorithm and clustering algorithms are, uh, are a lightweight approach. K-means uh, clustering algorithm specifically uh, is an uh, appropriate solution for this because it, it clusters the data points in a spherical shape, which means that um, you can then use outlier, boundary outlier detection to find your anomalies that then represent the attacks in the, net, in your net, in the device's traffic. So feeding in the benign device traffic, which is the extracted features on just the benign traffic data set. And I am using the fit predict uh, function here provided by scikit-learn, my k-means model, which computes all the clusters. And then you are finding the cluster boundary for each cluster that it will have, it will have computed. This is done by using um, sdist on scikit-learn as well. So which will give you the spatial distance in the cluster using Euclidean distance. And you set it as a percentile. So say 90% of the data points in the centroid or cluster, which is the center of the cluster, is the cluster boundary or 95, or whatever you want to define it to be. Um, and then anything outside of that is an outlier which you're classifying as an anomaly. So the inherent problem with anomaly detection is you will always have some false positives. As you can see, even when on the benign traffic, you'll have a couple of outliers in, in, in when you're defining the boundaries. So you want to save this model, and then you do the exact same pro, um, feature extraction process on your test instance, which is the mix of benign and attack traffic. And then you want to retrieve your, your model that you've trained on the normal traffic patterns, and then you fit the test instance onto the clusters. So you use model, so predict, the predict, k means predict function here to compute where each data point and which, 
where which cluster each data point will belong to. Scikit-learn will do this for you. And based on your known cluster boundaries that you've saved, you find the anomalies or outliers in, in those clusters. And those are the data instances that your model is now saying as anomalies. So the important part here is how you're going to validate it is you want to make sure that the benign instances are also classified as benign, not just the outliers are saying uh, attack. So that's also important. So that's how you measure the detection accuracy and the accuracy of your machine learning model as well. So just to wrap up, as you can see, my features, um, as an example, I've just provided an example here that for each attack rate, you can see that they exhibit different patterns. Um, this is in a very, just in one device, as an example. And that's my conclusion. <laughs> Python libraries, I found, that was, my, that was my journey. I found that Python libraries fulfilled all of my research needs from data analysis, um, matplot, matplotlib for plotting all of those graphs, um, and scikit-learn for the machine learning models, um, and so on and so forth. And yeah, and it's still a, this, this area of study is relatively fresh. So investigate and develop your own features and test it out. Uh, Graph-based features, for example, is an area that I haven't seen a lot of research into in, for IoT networks specifically. So things like weight, um, relative graph-based metrics such as the relative um, weight of each node and things like that, using those as features and then training your model on that. Um, that's it, and code is on GitHub. Um, you can find it, some of it is quite messy, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but have fun, uh, and that's it. Awesome, thank you so much, Amit. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Do we have any in the room? Yeah, hey, uh, if you ask the question, I'll repeat the question into the mic, and then Amit can answer it. How does the algorithm work for the IoT gateway? What, what do you mean exactly? Uh, say, for example, if the gateway um, communicates with the multiple nodes, like using some preferred verticals. So if I, uh, oh, so, pro, no, I can hear him, it's all good, yeah. yeah. Uh, but can you repeat the question for the audience online? Oh, okay. So how does um, the gateway work if it's communicating with proprietary protocols? Um, right. I think because the gate, the the sensor point was the gateway, so it will have captured all the traffic. So because it's sniffing all the traffic, it will have been visible. Yeah, like because if it's generally local local protocols are um, captured because they're broadcasted in the local network, they don't often do just one to one. That's, that, that was what I found in this data set. Again, like, because network traffic um, activities can be really diverse in range, uh, if, like, in terms of the range, it's hard to like, fully say this is, this is the way for everything and every network. This applies for, for what I found in the data set, really, I think. And that, that, that also goes into why anomaly detection is successful in academic settings and in operational use, you know, you, you'll have a bigger range of activities, yeah. Oh, yeah, we have one question at the back. Yeah, um, it's kind of similar to that. Why was it the speed of map address or, or you know, that kind of improved the approach you take? So the question was, uh, what if you spoof the MAC address or similar kind of ways of hiding your tracks? Um, as far as I'm aware, I, I don't think you can spoof a MAC address. So spoofing of IP addresses is only uh, vulner like a uh, drawback of IP protocol. I don't know if it, I don't think it's a drawback. I don't think it's possible in media access control layers. Oh, you can? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've oh, as far as, sorry, I just screwed I'll, up. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you how I learned that lesson the hard way sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I was, okay, I le you learn something new every day, okay. <laughs> This one, this one is a terrible one to learn in an operational capacity, trust me. Okay. <laughs> awesome. That is all the time we have. Uh, it is time to break for afternoon tea. 
This is your last reminder. This is the last time I will ask you for a lightning talk because after afternoon tea, submissions close. So while you're having your coffee, you can tap out a, a, a um, application into the lightning talk form and you'll find out by the end of today whether you're on the thing. So then that's when the prep starts, right? Um, cool, okay, thank you so much. Afternoon tea and then we are back at 3.20 p.m. <laughs>